In 77 BC, Lucius Marcius Philippus, a senior senator, speaks in the Senate House. At that time, however, Lepidus was a mere brigand at the head of a few camp followers and cutthroats, any one of whom would have sold his life for a day's wages. Now he's a proconsul with military power, which he did not buy, but which you gave him, with subordinates who are still bound by law to obey him. The most vicious characters of every class flock to his standard, inflamed by poverty and greed, driven on by the consciousness of their crimes, men who find repose in discord, disquiet in times of peace. Etruria is aroused, as well as all the other smoldering fires of war. The Spanish provinces are stirred to revolt. Mithridates, who is close beside those of our tributaries from whom we still receive support, is watching for an opportunity for war. Meanwhile, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, Mithridates prepares for war. He had several Romans in his entourage and retrained his men in the Roman fashion, mustering a force of 120, possibly 140,000 infantry, 16,000 cavalry, and 400 ships. In addition, Mithridates had planned several marriage alliances with the Ptolemies and Scythian chieftains, as well as making an alliance with Sertorius in Spain. By 75 BC, the political giant Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus was sent to Spain to assist Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius against Sertorius, who had created his own version of the Roman government in Spain. The war was going poorly, and Pompey, in dire need of help, requested it from the Senate. The consul Lucius Aurelius Cotta speaks in the Senate House. You have elected us to the consulship, Romans, at a time when our country is in dire straits at home and abroad, for our generals in Spain are calling for money, men, arms, and supplies, and they are forced to do so by circumstances, since the defection of our allies and the retreat of Sertorius over the mountains prevent them from either contending in battle or providing for their necessities. Armies are maintained in Asia and in Cilicia because of the excessive power of Mithridates. Macedonia is full of foes, as is also the sea coast of Italy and of the provinces. In the meantime, our revenues, made scanty and uncertain by war, barely suffice for a part of our expenditures. Hence, the fleet which we keep upon the sea is much smaller than the one which formerly safeguarded our supplies. In 74, Nicomedes IV of Bithynia died. Leaving no heir to his throne, the Romans annexed Bithynia. This accelerated the invasion plans of Mithridates. A year later, in 73, Mithridates, before invading Bithynia, gives a speech to his men. After thus setting forth the cause of the war, he dwelt upon the composition of his army and his apparatus, upon the preoccupation of the Romans, who were waging a difficult war with Sertorius in Spain, and were torn with civil dissensions throughout Italy. For which reason, he said, they have allowed the sea to be overrun by pirates a long time, and have not a single ally, nor any subjects who still obey them willingly. Do you not see, he added, some of their noblest citizens at war with their own country and allied with us? By the time Mithridates invaded Bithynia, Rome was effectively at war on three fronts. They had the war in Spain against Sertorius, against pirates in the Mediterranean, and in southern Italy with the revolt of Spartacus in 73. Rome also had issues with the Thracians raiding the province of Macedonia. On top of this, Rome's expenditure was growing to be more than its revenue, which meant a reduction in military resources. Now, it is uncertain if Mithridates learned about Spartacus before or after his invasion, but he must have been happy that Rome was having another war in Italy. In 74, Mithridates had prepared his invasion of Bithynia. In the spring of 73, he invaded, but Rome was not as distracted as he thought. The consuls of 74, Lucius Licinius Lucellus and Marcus Aurelius Cotta, had convinced the Senate to change their original provinces assigned to them after their consulship to commands in Asia Minor. Lucellus was assigned originally to Cisalpine Gaul, but with the death of the consul of 75, Lucius Octavius, in early 74, Lucellus exerted great pressure to have his command changed to Cilicia. Lucellus then raised his own army and went to Asia, knowing full well he would have the command against Mithridates should he invade, which by this time was a growing concern. Lucellus also received the former armies of Fimbria and Servilius Caesaricus, and he also probably received the province of Asia. Cotta was also originally assigned another province, which one is unknown, but he was assigned Bithynia in replacement of the previous governor, Junicus. By early 73, the proconsuls were in the field awaiting Mithridates. Mithridates no doubt questioned whether or not the Romans were as weak as he thought when the news arrived that two armies awaited him. Lucellus was on the move, moving troops around Western Asia. He was reported to have encamped in Phrygia, but Mithridates knew that Cotta and Lucellus were not on the best of terms. He sent his commander Diophantos, son of Mithares, to protect his southern frontier by garrisoning Cappadocia, with orders to attack Lucellus if he tries to invade Pontus. 
Mithridates marched his massive army through Paphlagonia and Galatia and arrived in Bithynia in nine days, which means he marched his army at around 20 miles a day, which is impressive for such a large force, which was around 140,000. At the same time, he sent a fleet from Sinope to the coast of Bithynia, under the command of Aristonicos, to make sure that the fighting did not reach Pontus. Aristonicos was able to convince Heraclea Pontica to join Pontus and provide them with triremes as well as supplies. Meanwhile, Mithridates advanced into Bithynia. Cotta, who was at the Bithynian capital Nicomedia and had relatively small forces, retreated to Chalcodon at the mouth of the Bosporus, leaving Bithynia open to Mithridates. Appian describes Cotta as a man who was unwarlike or completely weak in warfare, and Mithridates most likely knew this. His goal was to neutralize Cotta so that he could focus on the more experienced Lucellus. Cotta sent his naval commander, Publius Rutilius Nudus, with the land force to occupy a position near Chalcodon, but was defeated by Mithridates and driven back into the city. But Cotta and his men in a panic sealed the gates. Nudus had abandoned his soldiers, most of whom were killed. The king's infantry were led by Bastarnian infantry, whose home was north of the Danube. On the same day, Mithridates' fleet reached Chalcodon, which captured 60 Roman vessels. Cotta and Nudus remained barricaded inside the city. So the first engagement with Mithridates went badly for the Romans. Realizing Cotta was no threat to him, Mithridates began reorganizing the territory of Bithynia. Most of the major cities either willingly or forcibly joined him. Around this time, a representative of Sertorius, Marcus Marius, who was serving as Sertorius's quaestor, or presenting himself as an official of the Roman government, had arrived with troops. This became useful for Mithridates when he invaded other Roman territories. He acted as a subordinate to Marcus Marius when it suited him so that the Roman cities would surrender freely. Mithridates fulfilled his end of the bargain by sending 40 ships to Spain to join Sertorius. However, Sertorius died in 73-2 before they reached there, and so they most likely turned back. A legate of Lucellus, Lucius Valerius Triarius, was sent to the Hellespont to intercept them upon their return. Triarius was praetor in 78. The following year, he was sent to Sardinia in pursuit of Lepidus. By this time, he was Lucellus's naval commander. By the summer of 73, Mithridates had Bithynia under his control, as well as his fleet had access to the Mediterranean. He had defeated the proconsul Cotta, and so things were looking good for the king. However, the king's success will start to trend downwards. Lucellus began to send Roman detachments all across Asia Minor, engaging various Pontic forces. The legate Mamercus will defeat the Roman renegade Phanius and the Pontic commander Metrophanes, who had commanded Pontic forces since the First Mithridatic War. This battle would take place at an unknown location somewhere near Lydia. Pontic forces attacked Mysia and part of Phrygia, only to be repelled by Gaius Valuvius Naso. The Pontic commander Eumachos invaded Phrygia and killed many Romans, most likely traders and merchants, and advanced south into Pisidia, Isauria, and Cilicia, but was defeated by Diotarus, one of the tetrarchs of Galatia. Mithridates put virtually his entire force into trying to capture the city of Kaisikos on the Propontis. The city was located on a coastal island that was connected to the mainland by a causeway. The capture of the city would be the perfect staging ground for attacking Western Asia Minor. This would prove to be fatal. Mithridates had been overly optimistic by his success at Chalcodon and possibly his alliance with Sertorius, plus a Kaisikine force, which was part of the Roman forces at Chalcodon, had been defeated when Cotta closed the gates. Lucellus moved in quickly, and instead of engaging the massive Pontic army, he decided to siege Mithridates, which lasted until the beginning part of 72. Mithridates besieged Kaisikos from the north at the mountain known as Arctonisos. He also set up ships at the seaward side that were to be used as troop platforms. With the siege ongoing, the winter months became harder for Mithridates to maintain the siege. Supply ships eventually stopped coming in, and the troops began to suffer from famine. He sent his cavalry, since they were useless in the siege, along with some troops and baggage animals east along the coast of Bithynia. However, Lucellus caught wind of this, sent a detachment, and eliminated the force. News then reached Mithridates that Sertorius had been slain in Spain, which meant that Rome was now free from the west. Mithridates tried to regain the initiative by sending Aristonicos, his fleet commander, into the Aegean Sea with money to bribe the Romans, and probably to attempt to draw Lucellus away from Kaisikos. However, Lucellus was one step ahead. He got word of Mithridates' plan and captured Aristonicos before he even set sailed, and since nothing else is heard of him, he was probably executed by Lucellus. The loss of one of Mithridates' most senior commanders was the last straw. Mithridates took his fleet and sailed to Parion at the west end of the Propontis. The land forces commanded by Hermaios and Marius also headed west, but Lucellus intercepted them at the Granicos River and killed and captured many. Lucellus entered Kaisikos a hero.
and games were celebrated in his honor, which were still celebrated in the 2nd century AD. Mithridates had lost the bulk of his troops during the events at Kaisikos and took his fleet back to Nicomedia. He left 50 ships behind, and they were sent into the Aegean Sea under four commanders, Marius, Alexander, Dionysios, and Isodoros. Lucellus pursued the fleet, capturing first Isodoros and executing him at Troy. Then the rest of the commanders were found near the island of Lemnos, where Marius and Dionysios were killed and Alexander captured and used in Lucellus' triumph a decade later. Any hope and optimism that stemmed from Mithridates was now vanquished. Now Mithridates was by no means done, but this was the last serious threat that he posed. At Nicomedia, Mithridates had about 100 ships left. There was still no word on the whereabouts of the ships that were sent to Sertorius. The goal now was to defend Pontus while he recovered. Lucellus was in pursuit. Wasting no time, he sent his legate Vaconius to block Mithridates' retreat into the Black Sea. But Vaconius was being initiated into the mysteries on the island of Samothrace and got there too late. Mithridates had escaped with his ships. But Mithridates got caught in a terrible winter storm. He lost 60 to 80 ships. He landed at Heraclea. From there, he installed a garrison and continued on to Sinope and then to Amisos, organizing the defense of his kingdom as well as seeking support. The loss of the bulk of his fleet effectively put an end to Pontus being a naval power. Lucellus knew this when he declined the Senate's offer to send funds for a fleet. The victories gained by Lucellus led the Romans to believe that the war would come to an end, but Lucellus, who had been dealing with Mithridates since the First War, knew better. Lucellus knew that he would have to invade Pontus, but first to recover Bithynia. One by one the cities fell, most welcoming the Romans freely. Cotta finally felt confident to leave Chalcedon and move to Nicomedia, but remained about 20 miles from the city while it was being retaken. By the summer of 72, Bithynia was back under Roman control, and Nicomedia became the main headquarters for Lucellus. In the meantime, Mithridates was trying to find new ways to continue the war. He requested support from Scythian chiefs. However, Diocles, the man he sent to secure their support, defected to Lucellus. He sought support from his son-in-law, King Tigranes II of Armenia, who had ruled there for over 20 years, and his son Macaris, who was governor in Chimerian Bosporus. But neither of these men responded in a timely manner. He requested aid from Parthia and was rejected. With no support, Mithridates retreated to Kabira, where he did not give up, but raised a force of 40,000 infantry and 4,000 cavalry. Meanwhile, Lucellus, Cotta, and Triarius met at Nicomedia, the new headquarters. It was decided there that an invasion of Pontus would be undertaken, as well as news had arrived. The ships that were sent to Sertorius were spotted somewhere near Crete. Triarius was to take the fleet and block the entrance to the Hellespont, to keep the ships from entering the Black Sea. In the autumn of 72, or late spring of 71, the ships that were sent by Sertorius appeared south of the Hellespont, where they were defeated off the island of Tenedos. Cata was sent to take Heraclea Pontica, but Cata was failing to take the city. Memnon, a local, documented the event in detail. He writes, Cotta, who was encamped near Heraclea, did not attack the city with his whole army, but sent forward detachments, some from the Romans and many from the Bithynians. But as many of his men were injured or killed, he constructed various siege engines, including the tortoise, which rather alarmed the defenders of the city. He brought this forward in full force against a certain tower which seemed susceptible to damage. However, after one or two blows, not only did the tower remain standing, but the head of the battering ram was broken off. This restored the spirits of the Heraclians, but disheartened Kata, who worried that the city would never be captured. The next day, Kata broke the siege engine again, but without success, so he burnt the engine and beheaded the men who had made it. Leaving a guard by the walls, he decamped with the rest of his army to the so-called Plain of Lycaea, which gave him plentiful supply of provisions. From there, he laid waste the entire territory of Heraclea, causing great hardships to the citizens. After ravaging the countryside, Kata again attacked the walls, but he saw that the soldiers were reluctant to press the siege, so he led them away again from the walls and sent to Triarius, asking him to come quickly with his triremes and prevent food reaching the city by sea. Triarius took the ships which he had with him and 20 Rhodian ships, making a total of 43 ships. He crossed into the Euxine Sea and informed Cotta of the date when he would arrive. On the same day as Triarius' squadrons of ships appeared, Cotta brought his army up to the walls. The Heraclians were alarmed by the sudden arrival of ships. They put 30 of their own ships out to sea, though even these were not fully manned, and the rest of the men turned to defending the city. Eventually, the ships from Heraclea were routed, and they were forced to flee back into the city. Cotta also moved up the land army to renew the siege. Triarius's ships took up station on each side of the harbor, so as to prevent supplies of food reaching those inside the city, and the city was gripped by such a severe famine. 
Conocorix, the royal governor, was dismayed by these disasters and decided to betray the city to the Romans. Purchasing his own safety by the ruins of the Heraclians, Conocorix did not approach Cada, whom he regarded as oppressive and untrustworthy, but he made an arrangement with Chararius. Cada learned about the capture of the city, the slaughter of the citizens, and the looting of their property. He was filled with anger and immediately proceeded to the city. His army shared in his anger, not only because they had been robbed of the glory of victory, but also because all the wealth of the city had already been plundered by the other soldiers. Triarius, by making many conciliatory speeches and promising to make the booty available for them all to share, he averted the outbreak of internal strife. Meanwhile, Cotta seized the men who had surrendered to him and the prisoners of war, and he treated them all with the utmost cruelty. In his search for treasure, he did not even spare the contents of the temples, but removed from them many fine statues and images. He removed the statue of Heracles from the marketplace. Lastly, he ordered the soldiers to set fire to the city and burnt down many parts of it. Cotta, after acting as described above, sent the infantry and the cavalry to Lucellus, dismissed the allies to their homelands, and set off home with the fleet. Some of the ships which were carrying the spoils from Heraclea were sunk by their weight not far from the city, and others were forced into the shallows by a northerly wind, so that much of their cargo was lost. Cotta returned to Rome with his riches and was hailed as a conqueror, receiving the title of Ponticus. However, news of what had actually happened started to arrive in Rome. He was put on trial and expelled from the Senate. Lucellus pushed into Pontus through Galatia, but his soldiers were beginning to complain about the lack of plunder. But there was a threat that loomed over the proconsul. It was believed that King Tigranes of Armenia was looking for an excuse to attack Rome. Now Tigranes had extended his kingdom from Armenia to the Levant, taking advantage of Seleucid weakness, and had become quite powerful. If Mithridates were to make an alliance with Armenia, it would not look good in the eyes of Lucellus. So he played it safe, besieging Amisus into the winter of 72-1, and allowed Mithridates to rearm himself. In the spring, Lucellus made his move. There were a few engagements where at first Mithridates was gaining a series of victories, but his losses began to be too much, and Lucellus faced Mithridates at Kabira and chased Mithridates, forcing him out of Pontus. Kabira was captured and Amisos was reduced. In the beginning of 70 BC, Pontus was steadily falling to the Romans. However, issues soon reached Lucellus, where he was forced to head back to the province of Asia due to the economic situation there. The province of Asia was in financial ruin. The three Mithridatic Wars devastated Asia Minor, and moneylenders from Rome were extorting the provinces at extremely high interest rates. Lucellus cracked down on this and tried to save the cities by drawing up a moderate plan for payment of their debts and interest at moderate rates. This proved to be successful, and the inhabitants of the province were grateful, but this would cost him later on, and he would eventually be recalled to Rome. Mithridates was growing desperate. The kingdom he had ruled for half a century was coming to an end. In desperation, he wrote a letter to the king of Parthia, Phraates III. In his letter, which the historian Silas claims to have had, Mithridates states his view of the situation, explaining Rome's imperialism and warmongering in the east. He claimed that the Romans held the Parthians in contempt, and that it was only a matter of time before they were at war with Parthia. King Phraates III rejected his request for help. Only Tigranes could provide any real assistance. So Mithridates led east into Armenia, but not before ordering the executions and exile of many of his family members. This is because Macaris, the ruler of Bosporus, and the son of Mithridates, had defected to Lucellus. Tigranes had granted refuge to Mithridates, but only out of arm's reach. He did not allow Mithridates into his court, and this was an attempt by Tigranes to keep Armenia neutral. Lucellus feared an alliance between Tigranes and the king of Pontus. So he sent his legate and brother-in-law, Appius Clodius Pulcher, to Tigranes. Claudius told the king to hand over Mithridates so that he could be used in Lucellus' triumph, and if he failed to do so, that Rome would declare war. Tigranes, who was probably stunned by Clodius' ultimatum and arrogance, told Clodius that he would not hand over Mithridates and that he was ready to defend his kingdom. Lucellus received his reply, as well as a reported second letter which stated the imminent invasion of Asia. This was probably a fabrication and it gave Lucellus a justification to invade Armenia. Lucellus invaded, but back at Rome there was opposition. The Romans believed that Lucellus was warmongering and seeking unlimited command and riches. He crossed the Euphrates and routed King Tigranes near his new city, which was still being built, Tigronacerta, and Lucellus captured the city, reducing it to a village. King Tigranes finally allowed Mithridates into his court, and the two began to discuss strategy. Mithridates again reached out to Parthia, and Lucellus did as well. But political support started to run out and Lucellus' offensive stalled. By the end of 68, Mithridates was able to invade Pontus. 
Lucellus' governorship of Asia had expired and wasn't renewed, and Lucellus planned to attack the Parthians, but could not due to mutinous troops. Lucellus had left a garrison of 6,000 men in Pontus under three of his legates, Hadrianus, Sonatius, and Triarius. He ordered the Pontic garrison to rejoin him so that he could begin attacking the Parthians, but when they refused to do so, Lucellus instead invaded northern Armenia, where he gained a victory. He then returned southward to Nisibis, where he wintered there. However, during the same time, Mithridates had invaded Pontus and scored a series of victories against the Romans. Mithridates decisively defeated Hadrianus, and Triarius lost 7,000 men. However, Mithridates was wounded several times during the battles. Hadrianus was able to escape, and Triarius also managed to flee, but his troops mutinied, and Lucellus, who arrived from northern Armenia, had to hide Triarius from his men. The end was near for Lucellus. His victories fell short of completion. His invasion of Armenia was looked down upon by some as being unnecessary. With each exploit brought frustration back at Rome. When commissioners arrived from Rome to organize the province of Pontus, they were surprised to find that it was not even under Roman control. The equestrians wanted him removed because of his efforts in Asia. By 67, Lucellus was superseded in his provinces and his Mithridatic command was replaced by the consul Galabrio under the Lex Gabinia. His brother-in-law, Clodius Pulcher, who was serving under Lucellus, had aroused mutiny within his ranks. Because of the defeat of Triarius and the rest of the Pontic garrison, because of the mutinous legions and waning political support, Lucellus was forced to remain inactive while King Tigranes and Mithridates recovered their kingdoms. It will not be until Pompey Magnus receives the Mithridatic command in 66 that the Third Mithridatic War will come to an end. If you want to know how the Third Mithridatic War ends, you can watch my other video, The Life of Pompey Magnus Part 2. In the beginning of that video, I discussed his Mithridatic command as well as his organization of the East. Lucellus remained in Pontus until Pompey's arrival only for Pompey to undo everything Lucellus had done, which included edicts and provisions for his supporters. Afterwards, he returned to Rome where opposition blocked his triumph until 63. But in 63, Lucellus celebrated his great triumph. Mail-clad horsemen and scythe chariots, 60 members from the court of Mithridates as well as a life-sized gold statue of the king himself, said to be 6 feet tall. Wagons filled with precious stones, gold, and silver were hauled on display. 110 bronze-beaked ships were carried during the procession. Lucellus then had a great feast in Rome and the surrounding area. He then retired from politics only to come out of retirement a few years later to wreak his vengeance on Pompey Magnus by successfully blocking the ratification of his Eastern Acts with the help of men like Cato the Younger and Metellus Creticus. He would go on to remain a powerful figure in the Roman Senate until 59 BC, and after that preferred living life as a private citizen where he earned a reputation for his gardens, parks, and lavish dinners. He was also an historian, writing a history of the social war, written in Greek, was still read in the Plutarch's day, which was the 1st and 2nd century AD. He collected art, possessed a magnificent library, and loved intellectual discussions. Cicero will dedicate his second book on the academics to Lucellus, and the work is actually called Lucellus, but today we call it the Academica Priora. And that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.